some tips and some um, advice and some skills that hopefully you can take back and use uh, no matter what level you are in your career in the pharmaceutical industry. So our four talks are as follows. The first talk is called Leading at the Entry Level, Effective Leadership as a Protocol Statistician. And this talk will be delivered by Allison Headley from Merck. The second talk is Leading Without Authority, a Significant Challenge. This talk covers effective leadership as a program lead statistician, and this will be delivered by Yiping Mai from Amphi. Wayne Snavely from Merck will cover fostering excellence and give us some skill sets for effective leadership as a people manager. And finally, points to consider for effective leadership as an organizational leader will be presented by Bruce Sinkowitz, and our discussion will be led by Eric Wilstennis from Amphi. I hope you enjoy the talks we have prepared. So at this time, I'm going to introduce Allison Headley. Dr. Allison Pedley graduated from Boston University's Biostatistics Doctoral Program in 2010. Since graduation, she's worked at Merck supporting late-stage drug development programs in infectious disease and vaccines. She is currently a program lead statistician for Merck's largest and busiest vaccine program. Um, so she's on the second rung of this leadership ladder, but she's going to be delivering the talk um, that is relevant to uh, the entry level or protocol statistician role. Good morning, everyone. My name, as Lisa mentioned, is Allison Headley, and I'm doing this first talk in the series, which is entitled Leading at the Entry Level Effective Leadership for the Protocol Level Statistician. So, this talk today targets statisticians who are relatively early in their careers, um, within clinical development in the pharmaceutical industry. In this setting, you might not necessarily consider yourself a leader in the traditional sense because you're not yet a manager or a program lead statistician, but you can and should be leading and demonstrating leadership in your everyday activities. Now is really the time to build and develop your skills and your foundational knowledge that will make you a better employee now and a better leader in the future. If you want to be ready for that next promotion, and listen up because I'll be reviewing three keys to your success at leading at this level. And I'll also give you some tips on how you can stand out from your peers in your current role. <coughs> this information is really important for anyone who might be interested in advancing their career at this level. And it could also be important information for you to hear if you're mentoring peers or you have direct reports at this particular Fortunately or unfortunately, leadership is not an inherited trait that comes along with a change in your title. It's something that you must work on and develop from the early stages of your career. As statisticians, we have lots of training and education in statistics, but many of us don't have very much formal training in leadership. So here are my three keys to success at this level. So you want to do your job well, you want to build your network, and you want to develop your skills. Let's talk about each one of these in a little bit more detail. So first, you want to do your job well. There can absolutely be no compromise with this. You have to deliver high quality work within the proposed and expected timelines. This is the absolute foundation and core to your success. So secondly, you need to take your time at this stage in your career to listen and learn absolutely everything that you can about the roles in clinical development, the processes that are relevant to your job, the happenings throughout the trial life cycle, and how your role specifically fits in with all of that. By doing so, you are building the foundation of your knowledge for the role, and you'll need this for the rest of your career. You're also working to build your scientific knowledge and statistics, your clinical trial knowledge base, and your knowledge of the processes that govern our work. Speak up when you can and when you can add value. Key input is needed from you in the protocol design stages. It's also needed from you during development analysis and reporting and during your CSR writing. You should begin to feel comfortable driving decisions and discussions relating to these topics. 
and you should be helping to develop key messages and critical documents and presentations. Um, despite what the clinicians on your teams may think, it is not your job to produce every table, listing, and figure that they ask you for, but it is your job to think, act, and perform like the quantitative scientists that you've been trained to become. In order to do your job well, you also need to communicate regularly with your programming support team um, to ensure that you're constantly in alignment. Why is this important? Well, it probably is just common sense, but when you do your job well, you'll develop a really good reputation. And your team members will gravitate towards you, they'll want your input on things, they'll want you at the table when they're making important decisions. Um, they'll also want you on your team when they get assigned to their next project. So by doing your job well, you earn preferred partner status with those key stakeholders. From a management perspective, it's also really important to do your job well. Um, if you can't do your current role well, what is your management going to think about how you perform at the program level or beyond? And if you don't know how to do your job well and you don't know the ins and outs of the processes that govern our work, then how are you going to lead a team of people through those same processes once you're at the next level? So the second key to your success as a leader at the protocol level is to build your network. Um, there are a number of stakeholders that are important to this network that you should be focusing your effort and energy on. So first and foremost, cross-functional team members. You also want to build your network with your fellow statisticians, um, other leaders, and also sponsors. So we'll take a few minutes to talk about each one of these in more detail. So first, let's talk about cross-functional team members. These are arguably the most important of the stakeholders that I just listed. And most of your time should be spent building relationships with these particular individuals. You wanna work to earn the respect and trust of your cross-functional team. You wanna build allies with them. Um, especially with the key folks like your clinical directors, your regulatory liaisons, your data management colleagues, your statistical programming um, team, and those that are in the clinical sciences. You should be open to educating your peers with regard to concepts that are important to our discipline. If you've done so, then you've not only hopefully earned some brownie points with those people, but you've also trained somebody else to be a statistical advocate. Another key stakeholder um, for you are your fellow statisticians. So you want to work to build a resource network of fellow statisticians for yourself. You should be doing this both internally and externally. Internally, you want to network with the other statisticians in your department. Um, you also want to externally maintain and build your ties to academia. You can maintain your ties by um, staying connected with your graduate school professors and your graduate school colleagues. Um, you can also develop new ties with academia by teaching or with opportunities that you might have on your projects to interact with external statistical experts that are invited for input panels or for data monitoring committees. You can also work to expand your network by attending external events like conferences, like here we are at JSM. Um, or even volunteering for a local ASA event. Um, as you build your network, get to know what others are working on, what challenges they're facing. Um, you should be able to use this network as you advance in your career, as, either as a sounding board or a great resource should you need it. Um, other leaders are the next st stakeholder group that you'll want in your network. Observe the leaders that you come into contact with on a daily basis. Maybe this is your clinical monitor. Maybe this is your program lead statistician. Maybe this is your boss. Um, maybe it's even an assigned mentor that you have. Notice the things that you really like about their leadership styles and try to emulate them. Focus your efforts on these people, and those people meaning those at your level, and maybe even one level up, as opposed to trying to attract the attention of your company's CEO. Um, as you work to build your network, you should also try to attract sponsors for yourself. Sponsors are senior level champions who believe in your potential and are willing to advocate for you. The 
Given their position, they're able to increase your visibility, and they're also able to connect you with opportunities that um, will help advance your career in many different ways. Okay, so the third and final key to your success in the protocol level is to develop your leadership skills. There's a whole bunch of leadership skills that are up here on the slide, and I'll talk about just a couple of the most important. It might not be surprising that excellent communication is one of the most important of the leadership skills, and it's needed at all levels of leadership. Both verbal and written communication is absolutely key to being a successful leader and a successful statistician. You need to be able to communicate in a way that's clear and concise with your um, team members and other functional areas that clearly do not have the training and statistics that you all have. Um, and you need to be able to communicate in a way that drives your teams forward. Strong negotiation is also a critical skill of a protocol level statistician, especially when you're working with the clinical team to define the scope and timelines for analysis and reporting deliverables. Since statisticians provide key input on design, analysis, and interpretation, we also need negotiation skills to help the decision of the team in these areas as well. Negotiation skills are also critical when we're working with our programming support colleagues. Um, so at this point in your career, you also need to work on building your independence and communication. <clears throat> so some of that just comes along with increased time and increased um, experience, but some of it also comes from doing your homework and being ready and understanding the processes that, un that undermine everything that we do. Um, other important skills include being dependable, being motivated, having ambition, passion, integrity. Um, it's also important to be trustworthy and responsible, passionate. You also need to be positive. Need to be credible, decisive, committed. So lots of things to work on there. Um, if you're able to do the three things that I just talked about, so you're able to do your job well, you've built your network, and you've developed your leadership skills, then you will be recognized as a leader. Assuming all of that is done, you can also work to stand out from your peers by doing some of these things. So you might want to take initiative. You might want to say yes and be willing to work on something that's new, even if it's a little bit outside of your comfort zone. Um, you can volunteer for project and departmental activities that require extra hands. There's always people in need of help. On your projects, you can stand out by contributing in ways that add value. As a statistician, we have a unique set of skills in problem solving and logic that some of our cross-functional team members don't necessarily have. So feel free to speak up if you see something or have an idea about something, even if it's not statistically based. Um, people will, will be happy to hear from you. Um, you should also balance this contribution with having a filter. Um, there is such a thing as asking too many questions. Um, we've all been in meetings where there's that one person who derails the whole meeting with irrelevant comments and questions. Don't be that person. Uh, find the right balance between being engaged and informed without being a distraction. Finally, you can stand out um, by delving into your therapeutic area. We all can be better statisticians when we understand the science around our projects a bit better. Okay. So in summary, as discussed today, a protocol statistician, though perhaps not a leader in the traditional sense, has the ability to and should be leading and demonstrating leadership in their everyday activities. Doing your job and doing it well, building your network of key stakeholders, and developing your leadership skills are critical to your success in your current role and keys to your future success in your next role. Um, these concepts are all interconnected as well. So doing your job well and being present in your role um, helps to ensure others see you as critical to their team and it helps you build your network and earn preferred partner status, and it also helps you attract those sponsors that we talked about. 
the better relationships that you have with key stakeholders, the easier some parts of your job will be, like negotiation and influence. Um, in addition, the more your team relies on you, the more opportunities that you will have to demonstrate your leadership, and thus, the better leadership skills you will have in the end. So, start working to advance your career and be a leader today, regardless of what your current position is. As discussed, the protocol leads statistician. You have the ability to lead and demonstrate leadership. Don't wait until there's a job requisition for the job that you want to start working and leading in your teams. There's no better time to start than right now, and hopefully now you feel equipped with the skills and knowledge of what you need to focus on in becoming a better leader for tomorrow. Thank you. So with that 
phone call, I landed a two-year internship at the agency. So that experience finally paved the path of my career in pharmaceutical statistics. So I was so lucky. When I started my industry job, I was with a top statistical organization in the industry, but one of the top. So with the top, with a great organization, comes with great people and good examples of leader and leadership. So I feel I'm immersed by that environment by observing statisticians and the statistical leaders during all kinds of situations, governance committee, senior management meetings, the respect we receive when they talk, everybody looks at him or her. So I got inspired. So I observe, I learn, and I wait. I wait for that opportunity. So when opportunity comes, we choose to lead. So <laughs> finally, opportunity comes with another phone call. So my boss called me in my office. So he and I were in different sides. So there was this little oncology program that need a program leader statistician. So he thought that's a good thing. So at that time, I just finished um, a su successful supporting of uh, a huge cardiovascular fighting as a study statistician, as uh, Alison mentioned, and also a, an exemplar outcome. So I have capacity, and I have been longing for to be, to have my own program to lead. So I said, yes, right away, because when opportunity comes, we choose to lead. So, um, of course, back then, you know, I even, you know, it's it hardly for me to um, pronounce the drug's name, P, E, M, Pam, Broly, Umat. What's the name, right? And of course, at that time, I could never know, you know, the, the little program I'm going to lead is part of the most successful immunotherapy. Uh, now they will know as Pichula. So, okay, finally I got my own program to lead. And it's technically or literally my own because I was the only statistician that provided. <laughs> so, um, of course, looking back, we understood, okay, actually at that time, the company had spent all the effort, basically put a huge bet on that program. You know, though I didn't know that, but I could tell from people around me, from the things we did, you know, oh, this is big. So it turned out to be true. So the program got expanded so fast and faster than our team, the clinical team, the uh, uh, regulatory, you know, basically your big league players faster than what we have thought. So now it comes to challenge. So I'm still the only person, you know, the one man army, so I need to recruit. That's how we do. So I keep the bug in my management. I think, you know, this, I need a resource, please, you know. Because in the meantime, we are supporting this development program, you know, the uh, team, the phase three study here, uh, phase two study there, and maybe another phase three, um, later all of phase two, or an earlier stage of disease. So the team is strategically put all these pieces on the chessboard, right? Holding these strategic points and aiming for a big success later. So now we need the people, you know, as statisticians. So, um, in, you know, in the meantime, we also try this uh, kind of uh, um, backdoor to get more support. Um, so it's something like, uh, I didn't invent this by the way, but I didn't try that. So it's like, you know, imagine a situation um, during lunch time in the break room, you know, after, you know, the discussion of yesterday's uh, Game of Thrones episode, you approach to a session sitting next to you, oh, by the way, do you want to join the cause of fighting cancer? <laughs> How about working in oncology? So you try that. And if the person has interest and also have a capacity, then you go bottom up. You go to align with their management and your management and try to make things happen. And voila, you have a new 
number to the R. So, as I said, I didn't invent this. I should not take credit for this um, break room cafeteria scavenger um, strategy. <laughs> um, but it, it worked pretty well. It's one of the ways. So, um, trying to put this in the short, um, after that, and also got, I got tremendous support from both my management and the people, um, and management in oncology, and of course the whole uh, development part. So we had a soldier team of our arm. We have a new hire from graduate school. We have uh, a junior statistician from another therapeutic area, and we have uh, a relatively senior statistician from um, another discipline, like early development stats. So. We have an army now. We can call that right. So now we put everybody uh, sign up in the in the in the protocol in the, in the in the studies. So for people who are, you are familiar with the military history, right? You know there are this kind of army. They are young. They are, you know, have very high morale. They are very ready to engage. That's us. That was us. But the lack of they are lack of experience. And you know, if you are in that kind of state, you will make a mistake and you may lose. So, at this moment, I still want to thank you know the, the tolerance of uh, our staff management back then, you know, like the support they gave us, the guidance to train and tune this experienceless army into a better one. So, um, you know, they, those days, wow, it's unforgettable. So, we were, you know, as you already know, right? This is a big program. It's a high challenge. Workload is huge, timelines are short, and pressure is high. So we're making friends with the countless like midnight oils, or cup after cup of coffees, and alienate our family members. Right? We always say, you know, it takes the whole family to develop Kitruda, to support Kitruda. So to one more. And also, you know, when there are tensions, the team members may not at their best, right? You remember you have this environment in, within your team and outside the team. So that was this one um, incident. Like, I thought I got a heart attack. Like, really pain, you know, in my chest. Upon saying, well, still, you were a phone call, a WebEx meeting, I was saying a mistake in a post production table at the last minute. That table is supposed to support a high profile, high priority request. So, and then of course, I also definitely teared in my eyes of knowing my team, took the leadership, worked day and night during that weekend, and solved the problem before any negative impact could be created. And without me being there, well, you may want to be wondering. Why was I, right? Uh, I actually literally took that weekend off. Yeah, took the weekend off. And I had a good rest to kind of recover from that sort of uh, heart attack and uh, visit the doctors to root it out. Yeah, you got it. It's not a heart attack. It was a panic attack thanks to those economies of the long nights and overdose of coffee. And, you know, it got triggered. But looking back, it turned out that it might be a turning point. So I realized it has been some time. This team is young and brave, and team, you know, got, you know, imagine in your mind, you know, like like the ox going here and there, and we're getting to know things better, and we got to figure out the better and the smarter ways to work, and we got to making more friends in our peers, in our seniors, and in people who are not in our functional area. So, there are so, well, this is a, a long story, I know. So, uh, so I would say fast forward a few years. Um, it is really unforgettable to see this team, to see the, the thrill supporting two regulatory filing in parallel, and also the pride to see See them finally get approved and then continue um, ahead of the Duba day and continue to be strong around the world. It's 